Life with a purpose. Living life with a purpose. We talked about this morning, um, you know, not to tap out, but to take a time out. And how, the question I asked this morning was, how do you biblically do that? How do you biblically rest? How do you bi- biblically be restored? How is it that you can just take the time to allow God to work on you whenever you're ministering to other people? And so we're going to look at that tonight, and we're going to look at five things tonight. And I'm going to try to work through these five things. And so y'all just kind of ride along with me as we go along. And then we're going to have some prayer time. I'm telling you tonight, um, this kind of has been on my heart my mind for a while. I've been kind of mulling over this and thinking about this a lot. And kind of digging into this even before on um, this week and the week prior. Because Brother Randall Gunner has told me. And he, those of you who are around here much, you know that he has had some health problems. And some health issues, and he had to have triple bypass surgery. And he, he has warned me and told me, he said, Now listen, he said, Son, you, you need to learn from me that you got to take care of yourself. He said, If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of them. And so, uh, out of that wisdom, I've been trying to figure out, okay, what does God want me to do? What, what does he mean by that? Take care of yourself, because that's like a big old wide. Take care of yourself. What do you mean? You know, I mean, some people that might be taking, riding on their yacht. Oh, I ain't got a yacht. It might be riding on my 14-foot boat. You understand what I mean? I'm just saying, what, what does it mean to take care of yourself? What does it mean to take some time yourself? What does it mean that God, what is it that God wants you to do? So I just kind of have been thinking about this and chewing on this, and I, there's five things that I believe God has laid on my heart. And I really feel like this is a message that we need to hear and that God wants us to hear because I really believe that the devil has been fighting this thing. I mean, honest to goodness. It just feels like the devil's been fighting it. And so I really believe that something we need is a church. And I, that I need. I desperately need it. I'm telling you. And so y'all stand with me on the reverend for reading God's word. We're going to dive into Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 30 and 31 again. Kind of kick start it. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things. But what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure, leisure so much as to eat. Dear Heavenly Father God, I just pray that you would just bind every spirit, but the Holy Spirit from moving in this place tonight. And God, that you would have free reign in this place. You would preach your word through me tonight, God, unashamedly and boldly and with love, Father. God, I just want to be used of you tonight. I just pray you just pour it out in this place tonight, God. We desperately need you tonight. We desperately need you each day in this dark hour in history, God, in, in such a time of pressure, God, and, and attacks on God's people. Lord God, we just pray for your help tonight. We just pray for your uplifting, for, Lord, just uh, our guidance. Lord, just give us wisdom tonight. And, Lord, speak to us, Lord, as a church and also, Lord, Father. I just pray that you'd speak to me and everyone else personally, Lord. You would help us, Lord, to apply these truths to each of our individual lives in the way that you'd have it done. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Um, live life with a purpose. Um, there's just five things, and I kind of um, got some peas all in there. So it's kind of like one of the things, if you really try to say all five of them at once, you kind of get it all mixed up and jumbled up, and it would be hard to say. But we're going to look. You see that this morning I talked about how the disciples had went and served God, had done what God had asked, and they'd come back, and they were so excited. And Jesus, you know, he took the time to tell them he knew that they needed rest. He knew that they needed to eat. He was trying to help them understand how to sustain what he was going to do through them. And so not only did he teach them the words that they needed to hear, that they needed to learn in their mind and their heart to be able to go and do, but he also taught them in the way that he lived and done what he done. And he is the perfect example. He is the great example that each and every one of us can look to whenever we have a question about life. I'm telling you right now, Jesus done it right. He done it all the right way, and we can trust that tonight. Verse 45 in chapter 6 says, and this is after they'd fed 5,000. This is after, you know, he he had had that talk with them. He looked. He seen he had compassion on these people. He fed the 5,000. You know that story if you've been in church very long. If not, read it when you get home. But we're going to skip on over to verse 45. And it says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get in the ship. He urged them, he told them, to get in the ship and to go to the other side before in the Bethsaida. While he, he, went, while he sent away the people. 
And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he come up to them, walking upon the sea. Boy, that would be a sight to see right there now. And would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hard. Now look at these verses. Look at verse 40, 45, verse 46. Listen now. One of the things we need to do is when we live life on purpose, when we know that we've got a purpose, that we're living life for, one thing we've got to do is we've got to purposefully perfect our priorities. See what I'm saying about saying it too fast? I had to take my time. We need to purposefully perfect our priorities. You say, well, I can't be perfect, but your priorities can be perfect. God has told us. I'm telling you right now. He told us to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be what? That's exactly right. He told us, you know, you need to get your priorities in line. He told us the greatest commandment was to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. He's saying, you need to put me first. He's saying, you need to put me first. And God needs to be first. Now, don't get God and the church confused. The church is not God. The church is the bride of Christ. God is God. And he said to put him first. And then when you put him first, your spouse should come second. Not your kids. A lot of people have that backwards. Their marriages get wrecked because they get this priority out of line. Your spouse comes before your kids. See, and then you got your kids. And then everybody else. And then you. You see, I put us on the end. Yourself is on the end. Because he said to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. See what I'm saying? He's saying put everybody else first ahead of you. See, a lot of times when we get worn out, when we get tired, we become selfish without even realizing. And we aren't worried about everybody else because all we can think about is the hurt and the pain that we're in. Or, you know, you just, it's, it's like somebody, it's like a, somebody is hurting so bad they just want to relieve the pain for a little while. You understand what I mean? They aren't thinking about all the ramifications for everybody else, and your mind is not right at the time. And so you just want to relieve the pain. But God said, you know, we need to perfect our priorities. We need to get them in line. And see, I say it this way. You need, first, you need to put your God, second, your girl, and then third, your game. Amen? Three G's of your priorities. Your God, your girl, and your game. Now, for you ladies in here, your guy. You get what I'm saying? But I said girl. I don't want to get that confused tonight either. You know what I mean? All right, listen, but you got to do that purposefully. You hear what I'm saying? It doesn't come by accident. When a man or woman of God puts God first, that ain't by accident. You got to be purposeful about the way you do that. It's got to be intentional. You got to think about it. And you got to think about every aspect of your life when it comes to that because things will slip in there. You going to put your wife after God? You, that needs to be purposeful. You got to do that because if not, everything else will take up that time you need to be spending with your spouse. You understand what I mean? And you'll find that people that get these first three right normally have everything else fall in line. But I'm telling you, it's a hard thing to do, but we need to purposefully perfect our priorities. The next thing we need to do is we need to have a purposefully partnered attitude. We're not in this thing alone. Look in verse 49, what it says. It says, oh, 48. And when he saw them toiling, you see what it says? When Jesus walked by, when he was going to Bethsaida, he wasn't going to stop. He was heading on by is what the Bible says. He was going to pass by them, but they cried out. But when he went by and he seen them, you look at what it says. It didn't say he saw part of them toiling. He didn't say he saw one of them toiling. Who did he say was toiling? Them. He saw them toiling. I'm telling you right now, it, we need to have a perfectly partnered attitude. I'm telling you tonight. We need to remember that we're not in this alone. And we need to remember that the burden is not for one of us to carry, but all of us to carry. You hear what I'm saying tonight? I'm telling you tonight, and that needs to be purposeful. Sometimes, listen to me, sometimes you can, you can because of the trouble it is to include other people, you can hurt yourself long term. 
This is what I mean by that. You take some of you mothers in here. Now, y'all are great mothers. You make sure the bed is made. You make sure the kids' clothes are washed. You make sure the food is cooked. But I'm telling you right now, they leave your house one day. They're going to leave you. Some of them's done left y'all's house. Some of y'all's kids have done grown. And they done left this way. And I ain't condemning you, beating you down tonight about it. I'm just telling you the truth. They just happen sometimes. But they're going to leave your house without knowing how to clean the house, without knowing how to make the bed, without having to cook any food. You know why? Because it was a whole lot easier for you to go in there and make that bed than it was for you to get them in there and show them and argue with them. Or maybe, listen to me, listen to me, maybe they didn't make it just right the way you like it. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe it ain't just like you want it. So, in other words, long term, you hurt yourself because it's just easier at the time and you don't think much about it. But let me tell you something. People pay for those type of attitudes when we don't take the time to teach and mentor and include other people in what we're doing. Listen to me now. I'm telling you right now from experience, me and my wife got married. I don't know how to cook nothing. She didn't know how to cook. She didn't know how to clean. She didn't know how to wash clothes. Nothing. You know why? Because her mama. Her mama. I'm telling you, her mama keeps her house, in. I mean, just beautifully done. You understand what I'm saying? But long term, somebody's going to pay. You get what I'm saying? So I had to eat Hot Pockets for six months of my life. I mean, I was in dire need of some help. I so wish you'd at least taught her how to cook something besides Hot Pockets. We could at least alternate it every other night. You get what I'm saying? Even if it's a little thing. See, sometimes we, we think about all these big jobs in the church. Man, it may be that somebody just comes along and helps you with a little thing in what you're doing. Include them in anything you can. It's, I mean, it's a purposeful, partnered relationship. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to do that on purpose. You've got to purposefully, when you have a ministry that's growing and it's thriving, you've got to purposefully teach people to do things that you're doing so that you won't have to do them anymore. Because let me tell you something. Every person that's added to this church Every person's at that youth group, every person's at that children's group, every baby out of that nursery. That's more work to be done, and so it takes more people. And you're going to be used up and used for other things. So we need to be, have a purposeful attitude of including people. You understand? And partnering with one another. It is not somebody taking your job. It is God helping you. Let go of it. God's wanting to help you. You ever seen somebody drowning and, and somebody comes to save them and they about drown that person when they try to help them because they're kicking and screaming and just won't just, just be still and let them take them onto the edge. God's wanting to help you. And so many times we fight God's help because we are scared or we are worried or we like what we're doing. There's some things I love to do that I've had to let go of since I've started pastoring because the church has changed. And so we've got to be purposeful about a partnered attitude. Listen, that's number two. Number three, we need to be purposefully, we need to have a purposeful, persistent appetite. When you get worn down and you get beat up, listen, what you want to do ain't what you need to do. Here's what you're going to want to do. You're not going to want to pray. You're not going to want to read the Bible. You're not going to want to come to church. Amen? Hey, some of you act like you ain't ever been there. If you ain't, you need to get to work and you'll figure that out. Amen? Listen to me. Hey, I know. I just had to say it, brother. I just say it, brother AJ. <laughs> oh. Uh, some things are better left unsaid, but that needed to be said. Amen. But listen, a, a persistent appetite, and you need to be purposeful about it. When you start getting worn down, this is the attitude you've got to have. You've got to have, you know what, I'm going to get fed. I need to get fed, and no matter what, I'm going to make sure I get fed. Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Think about it. In John 21, Jesus was talking to Peter after Peter denied Jesus and failed God. And let me tell you something. Peter jumped out of that boat ran to the shore where Jesus was at. But Peter didn't want to talk to God. He didn't want to talk to God. That's what I'm telling you. When you get tired, when you get worn down, you'll feel the same way. But listen, Jesus didn't let him stay there. Jesus told him three times, three times he told him something. In John 21, you go home and read it. He told Peter, he said, you know, he asked him in three different ways, Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter said, you know, yes, Lord, in different ways. He said, yes, Lord, I love you. And then what did Jesus tell Peter? Was, and let me tell you something, it was the most important thing Peter was to do when he got himself right. He said, if you love me, do what? My sheep. Feed my sheep. He told him again. The second time, he said, feed my lambs. The third time, he said, feed my sheep. Because that is the most important thing for a Christian, is the Word of God and staying in, I'm telling you, in touch with the Word of God. You've got to eat. When so many times, many of us seen somebody sick, when they get sick, what do they do? A lot of times they lose weight. When they, I'm telling you, but, but think about it now. You ladies in here, you guys in here who have taken care of a sick child that's had a stomach virus, how do you know they start feeling better? Well, I know he's feeling better. You know why? Because Nathan wanted a Big Mac. You get what I'm saying? I know he's starting to feel better. And that's what I'm saying. You can look at somebody when they're needing this, when they're needing what we're talking about today. When they start, I'm telling you, getting hungry again. You know things are starting to get right inside of them. You know things are starting to cook. But you need, I'm telling you, you need to be purposeful about it. You've got to. You've got to. You've got to stay hungry. I'm telling you, it is so hard sometimes to do, though. Because you don't want to see it. You don't want to hear it. But God said you need to eat. And bread, physical bread, anything physical... Cannot help you spiritually. You have got to be fed spiritually. And it's through the word of God. You got to eat. You ain't going to want to. You're going to want to stay away from it. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. The other night when I went over there. I went over there to Laurel Chapel Baptist Church to revival. I'm telling you that evening when I got home. I didn't want to go anywhere. I was tired, man. It's been a rough year for my family. That ain't no joke. There's been a lot of stuff going on lately. It ain't just with my family, but man, all the death. You know, I went Monday. I went to the funeral home three times in 24 hours. Mr. Burner, he told me, he said, son, next time I see you, I hope it's at McDonald's. I told him, I said, man, you've got to get me a parking spot out there. You hear what I'm saying? It takes something out of you. You don't want to go. I didn't want to go to the revival the other night. Not in my flesh. But I knew. I said, hey, I'm getting worn down. I'm getting empty. I need something. So I went to hunt me something. And I found me a revival to go to. Saturday night, I went up there to the bridge where Christian was preaching up there. Man, I'm telling you, I needed to eat. And God fed me. And you know what? Yeah, I, my body might have been a little more rested if I'd have stayed home. But guess what? On the inside, when I woke up this morning, I was ready to roll. Good gosh, I was ready to roll. I was ready to head to that river. I'm telling you, you got to eat. And sometimes you got to make yourself eat because you know you need to eat. It ain't what you want to do. But it's what you got to do if you want to get better. It's what you got to do if you want your energy back, spiritually. I'm telling you, and, and, and I don't know how you are, but, like, I'm, like, really good about eating clean as long as I don't get started. 
But now let me tell you something, Brother Donnie. I can do really good for two or three days, and I can walk right by them. But if I ever take that bag of potato chips and sit down, and I ain't talking about a little bag. I'm talking about the whole big bag. If I ever get started, you know what I do? I eat that whole bag. Yeah. My kids will hide that food from me sometimes. They know when I, get, when I say I'm hungry, I'm going to eat something. But when I get started, I just can't quit. You'll start out with the Word of God. You might have been without it for a while. You might not have been, been eating like you normally eat. But let me tell you something. If you'll start, you just take it and chew it on it and eat it. Man, you just won't be able to quit. And then it'll get tasting better and better and gooder and gooder. That ain't good English, but it's good preaching. <laughs> good preaching. But you got to be purposeful about your appetite. You got to be persistent about it. You got to eat all the time, no matter how you feel. You can't go by your feelings. The fourth one we need to be purposefully prayerful about the atmosphere we're in. He said, Brother Greg, what, what, what does all that mean? Let me read you something out of Luke. In um, 22, Luke 22, I want to read this to you right here. It's verses 31 through 34. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That's what Jesus told Simon Peter. He said, the devil's going to come after you. He says, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both in the prison and the death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We need to pray for one another. Because we all need prayed for. As strong as Simon Peter was, as good as he felt, he felt pretty good right then. As a matter of fact, he was quite cocky about what he said. So he was feeling himself about then. He was feeling good. But Jesus said he had prayed for him. And if Simon Peter, one of God's disciples, one of the greatest men that ever lived and walked the face of the earth, one of the men that God used so greatly, wrote part of the Bible, needed to be prayed for. We all need it. We all need it. And listen, listen to what he said. And I just got to throw this in there. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I just got to throw this in there. Look at what he said. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you. Don't you get that tonight? Now Satan come knocking. Satan came for him. He said he had desired to have you. But God didn't let him have you. Amen? Hey, hey, don't give that power to the devil tonight. Don't give the power of death and life to the devil. I'm talking about not physically or spiritually. Satan can't take you out. You're in the hand of Almighty God. Satan desires to take each one of us out spiritually. And I'm telling you, he's going to come after each one of us. But we're in the hand of God. And just because Satan wants to take us out, he can't because my God is greater than him. Amen? Amen? And we need to pray for one another. And look what he told Simon Peter. He said he had prayed for Peter, but when Peter was strengthened, and he was ready, and he was right, he told Peter to go and help them. You get what I'm saying? It's like a revolving door. It's like a circle that keeps coming around. When I pray for David, it helps David to be a stronger Christian. When David is a stronger Christian, he'll pray for his pastor. And it'll help me. Don't you get it tonight? That when you help your brothers and your sisters, it helps you. And that's what God is saying. We need to purposefully be prayerful about our atmosphere. And not only do we need to be praying for one another, but we need to have people praying for us. Even Johnny Hunt, great preacher, great pastor in our day and time, he'll take a couple of weeks in a year. He'll go off somewhere, him and his bride. He'll turn off his cell phone. He'll get along with God. And he tells his people to please, please pray for him. While he's gone, that God would strengthen him. 
Even a great mighty man of God like that in our day, he needs and he realizes the need for the prayers of his people that are around him. I'm telling you tonight, when I go to preach a revival, I can feel the couple of weeks before that time when people start praying for me. I just love preaching revival because I can feel God's power just turning it up another notch inside of me. Why? Because there's churches praying for me. We need to be, have a prayerful atmosphere, and we've got to be purposeful about that. If you don't make yourself and take the time, you're not going to pray for your brother and sister. I'm telling you, our schedules will just eat it up. We'll feel like we don't have time. But we need to take the time and pray for one another. We need to take the time and pray for one another. Look at what Jesus did. Look at chapter 6 again in Mark. Look at verses 45 and 46. It says, And straightway he constrained his disciples, talking about Jesus, to get into the ship and go to the other side before him to Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, look at what he did. Now listen, if you can't take Johnny Hunt needing prayed for, if you can't take Simon Peter needing prayed for, if you can't take and see that they had to take some time to go and get along with God, and that all of us as Christians need that, and we don't even need just to be praying for each other, we need to take time and, and be purposeful about our atmosphere of prayer, not just from other people, but in our own lives. Look at what Jesus did. It says he departed into a mountain to what? So if God himself, Jesus, in the flesh, took the time to go get along with the Father and to pray, why? Why did he do that? Because there was something he needed to get to the other side. Don't you get that? Jesus got weak like we get weak. He didn't carry that cross all the way up that hill. He had to have a man help him. Because he ran out of juice. He'd give it all. And he needed some help. So if the Lord Jesus himself needed something from God that he could only get with him and God alone, don't you know tonight that that is your lifeline as a Christian? That you've got to have that. And you've got to be purposeful about it. He let him go on to the other side. He let him go ahead. And you think sometimes, well, if I take the time to do that, I'm going to be behind. Just let me remind you what Jesus did. Can't you just remember what he said in those few verses after that? They were bouncing around in the ship. They were toiling. They were giving it all they had. The storm was there. The ship wouldn't go very far. But what after Jesus took the time to go spend with his father? What did he do? He caught up with him. And he was going to pass by. He was going to get further. Why? Because he took the time to pray. And not only was he going to get further, but he had it in him to help them make it. Don't you get that all those people that jump ahead of you because they don't take the time to pray? That you're going to be walking along and pick them up? Because they're not going to make it where God has sent them? 